don't know how many of you have been together for 25 years, but I would say that any of you that have been together for 25 years should get an award. But when you see a band that's been together 25 years, you better pay attention. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the lead singer of a Grammy-nominated group called Swing Out Sister, who sold millions of records worldwide, who is here in an intimate setting in London to talk about Swing Out Sister's music, their life, their work, and the creative process, and to bring us into what is considered an obscure domain. Corinne Drury, their lead singer, one of the founding members of the band, is a classy, kind, accessible, creative artist who has no problem sharing the truth of her life and work. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Corinne Drury to It's Rainmaking Time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. I'm here in London with Corinne Drury. That's correct. <laughs> she is the lead singer of my favorite band, Swing Out Sister and along with Andy Connell and the rest of the band has been touring and bringing uplifting music to audiences around the world since 1985? Yeah, yeah. it was. 1985, it's so long ago I can't remember. <laughs> A good few years. It, it can't be that long because you all have been together longer than many couples have been together. And yeah. This band deserves a Nobel just for being together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well we keep things moving. I think probably uh, keeping things interesting is the key and there always has to be an element of surprise for us as the band and also to anyone who's listening things that um, we're, when we're rehearsing to do a tour or when we're writing a song if we can surprise each other then we know it's going to be a surprise to whoever's listening I love your music. The uplifting, big, open, spacious joyousness of the heart that your music imbues. You've been touring for 25 years, and when I watch your audiences, people are so happy and full of love. I have never in an audience seen the happiness and the joyousness of people holding each other in an audience ever, and I've seen everybody. Oh, well, that's lovely to know. I mean, I, I think there's a, a strange thing happens when you perform to an audience. I, I tend to find that we get lost in, in, the, in the moment. I mean, people come to a concert because they want to listen. You're on the stage because you want to play. And then it's like you're sending this stuff out, sound, and it generates this other energy. It's quite a, an amazing thing. I mean, I forget myself. I don't think about standing on a stage and singing anymore. I'm just feeling stuff coming back from the audience. It's the greatest feeling to see that people are enjoying what you're doing and you're enjoying what you're doing. It, it creates another third thing, which it, you can't really explain it, but all you can do is feel it, I suppose. Life is different when you're not touring, isn't it? Yeah, it's a time of recharging and sometimes it, it feels it can feel a bit flat if you're not careful because you're on tour with a band of great people, there's lots of ideas flying around, you've got a performance every night, a lot of traveling. You have to build up a lot of energy to do a tour, but you use a lot of energy doing it as well. So when you come back, some kind of recuperation is required and a bit of recharging. And then if you're getting ideas together for something new, it is very quiet and quite solitary. It needs to be. So it's the complete opposite to performances and being on tour and surrounded by people and energy and things. You then come back into a quiet time and are delving into the depths of your mind for whatever you're going to be doing the next time. And I think that's where you can get a bit lost sometimes. I think, why am I doing this? Where am I going? <laughs> what, what was that all about? Will I, will I ever be able to do it again? I'm sure every artist, musician, writer, creative person, well anyone, you know, you go through those feelings, you've just done something that's been really fulfilling and then you go away and you're going to start from scratch again to think of the, the next thing. And um, I think probably you just have to look the other way. I, I feel like looking the other way is the thing that helps, like staring at a blank piece of paper, singing notes that haven't come into your head yet. It's like Trying to think of something, focus on writing a song, is not really the way it works. I think you think of something else. Go for a walk, sit in a cafe, swim 20 lengths at the swimming baths, go for a ride on your bike, 
stroke a few dogs and cats. <laughs> now we're talking. I think I'll sing my song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come down from the pasture, Corinne. Okay. <laughs> and then while you're not thinking about it, something will just enter your head and just fill you with a nice feeling. I think that's probably what Andy and I try to do. You're trying to capture the feelings that um, perhaps other songs have given to you or that you feel when you're you're not thinking about anything, just something enters your head and spreads this great feeling. And it, it's an imaginary thing. It doesn't exist. I always remember when we started off writing songs, I had been a fashion designer and spent five years at art school before getting into creating things out of sound. So I, <laughs> I was very confused because I couldn't see anything. In those days we had cassettes and I'd have hundreds and hundreds of recordings on cassette and I had to do something to make each cassette. If, if you have a recording of something that's a song before it has a name, before it has any lyrics, how do you remember this piece of music? Andy could always just remember the melody off by heart and his key is the keyboard so he can lay his fingers on the keyboard and remember it. But for me to remember it in my head, I'd have to draw a picture or some colours or stick flowers or a, some leaves or something on the cassette boxes just to say, this was that song, this is the next. Before it has an identity, you know, you've got to imagine what it makes you feel like. And that's a, a bit like how Andy and I work together. He, more often than not, well, he always writes a piece of music first. And then he'll say, Corinne takes 10 years to come up with the lyrics. <laughs> but I usually react to the music. I have hundreds and hundreds of little notebooks with a line here and a line there and a phrase here. And when I hear the music, I'll just see what feeling that conjures up and what it makes me sing. I wouldn't consider myself a great lyricist, but I think that something happens. Some people look for meaning in lyrics, and I don't think it's quite as straightforward as that for me. I, I don't really mind what the lyrics say as long as they say the right thing at the right time with the music and then that opens this other Pandora's box of thoughts in your mind. If the music and the words hit each other at the right time, it doesn't really matter what you're singing about, it's what it makes you feel. So do the words come to you or does Andy come up with the sound of it, the feeling tone of the music? No, Andy writes the music. He comes up with the sound and the feeling, and then I'll come along and contradict it all with some words. <laughs> I mean, the words don't always go in the same direction as the emotions that you would imagine the music conjures up. I think we're quite antagonistic. If, if I'm singing something sad, Andy will play something really happy, and if I'm singing something <laughs> happy, Andy will be melancholy. The inner workings uh, of the two of you. Yeah, I think This is creative process, though, right? <laughs> Yeah, we are very antagonistic in a very gentle way. I don't think we, we get into... I call into it creative friction. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think there has to be some friction. If you're all going in the same direction all the time, you're not really going to come up with something new. I think it's those musical arguments that actually take you to another place. Do you ever find that in the creative realm that you get attached to the child, which is the song, and you have a vision or a sense of it to go a certain way. Andy may have a very, very different sense. How do you find the way to resolve? Um, and is that because of your larger relationship or the bigger relationship between the two of you that allows for that? Or is it some protocol you've agreed on? Oh, no, we don't agree on anything. I don't think anything is <laughs> spoken about. And there's, that very often happens. In fact, with most things we do, we have a disagreement about and we're both very stubborn so we'll kind of stick to our guns but make a few little exceptions and changes till we find some way we can agree you know I don't think either one of us would completely get our own way unless it's an instrumental <laughs> sometimes if Andy really can't agree with something I come with or if I think he's written a piece of music so beautiful I don't want to spoil it by putting words or a voice on it. I go, this one should be an instrumental. And I think some of them just speak for themselves. They don't need words, they don't need lyrics, they don't need a voice. Sometimes it gets in the way. You remind me of a really good midwife. <laughs> the way you talk about music, like you're part of bringing it to life. You're not just transmitting it, 
but you also have the role in bringing it, inviting it in, and then helping it move through that time space to get to us. Yeah, I suppose so. The conception of any idea, it's almost, um, you would love it to just stay at the conception stage. <laughs> we don't want to get into too many analogies <laughs> here, but I, I think before you actually know what it is, it's, uh, it's quite um, an exciting time because you can't explain it, you can't describe it. It's this feeling in your head, your mind and your senses. And I think Andy has maybe one idea at conception, I have another. So if we're not careful, when the two of us get together, you can destroy the other's conception of what this idea might be. So it, it takes quite a long time for you to actually bring it out into the world. You know, you want to protect this thing before it, it comes out. And I, I probably have not really analyzed it before like that but I think um, Andy likes to be on his own when he's getting his ideas together and so do I and it's quite difficult when we bring the two together to bring it out into the open because you know it could destroy it all so is that the role for example of a good producer to help bring that through like, it really like is. someone like Paul talk a little yes. bit about Paul Stavery Paul O'Duffy Paul, Paul Stavery O'Duffy was actually um, a great person to bring Swing Out Sister together and to nurture us and to make our songs, to take them to a different place, I think. Paul's been like a, another member of the band for the, the time we've been together and, and worked together. I think when we first started out, none of us really knew what we were doing. We were all quite new to writing songs together. Andy had been in a band prior to Swing Out Sister a certain ratio and they were kind of funky industrial funk they were really into the new york dance scene in the early 80s and the, and the music reflected that with quite a lot of jazz as well um martin who's in the, the band at the time had previously been in a band called magazine and they were kind of punk and quite rocky um and paul came I don't know where Paul came from. He had been working <laughs> with his brother. He'd, he'd been don't there. mind her, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he was just, uh, he arrived at the right time. And and I don't think any of us understood each other. This is the, the great thing of all these different minds coming together. Paul had been working in America. He'd worked with people like Barry White and the Barkays. And he'd also been an engineer and worked alongside his brother who'd worked with people like the Walker Brothers and the Fifth Dimension and a, a lot of yeah. 60s classics <laughs> and I think that's where Paul gets that great understanding of harmony and arrangements and depth that you can capture in a recording. So when we got together it was a bit of a mess and the fact that we finished anything with our first album It's Better to Travel <laughs> was quite an achievement because <laughs> it's trying to round up you know, four different people's ideas of what a record should be when nobody really knows. I think the area where our paths crossed and we managed to agree it, to a certain extent was film scores. And we all loved John Barry and Ennio Morricone. So that was a really good starting point. And uh, from my point of view, it was the collaborations with John Barry and Sh Shirley Bassey. Oh, it was wow. Epic Bond theme tunes and, and then we kind of from that progressed to Burt Bacharach and Dionne Warwick and a lot of those great songs but I'd always liked soul music, Tamla Motown, Northern Soul, Andy loved jazz, Martin was into rock and punk, Paul was into the Beach Boys so it was a kind of melting pot you know I mean the Beach Boys amongst many other things I'm just trying to simplify it or otherwise <laughs> I could go on for hours about all the music we like but we were trying to find a place where all those passions met and um, you know there was a lot of disagreement a lot of frisson as you, <laughs> you say um, <laughs> you know we were very antagonistic but I think it made us clear out the stuff that really wouldn't work and and it stuck together somewhere where all of, all of those ideas met. Did you ever want to quit when it got to a certain point of not really. No. I think I wanted to see it through, but it was tough. Constantly having to fight for your area. And I think it's because none of us really knew what it was. It was just a time of discovery for all of us, I think. We didn't really 
know quite what we were trying to achieve, but we knew it had to be good. This was our first album. And it was great having Paul Stavely O'Duffy at the helm because he, <laughs> he was a good referee and he was tough enough to be able to say, no, 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 cut the crap, this is what we're doing. And he, he did steer a very difficult ship. <laughs> 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 but it, the final piece of music we did was the theme from It's Better to Travel. And I think that sealed the fact that we always had this cinematic soundtrack idea that would close our album you know it was like this is where we're going next and so uh, that led the way to the next album kaleidoscope world that was quite a lot more cinematic and we got to work with jimmy webb and incorporated lots of vocal harmonies and orchestration it, it was great it was just like our imagination our imaginations unfolded with every album to, into a slightly different world. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. A good voice ad lands in the minds and hearts of its rain making time listeners. It expands your branding, it opens doors, it gets the listener to want to focus for a couple of minutes on your product, service, business, or yourself. It puts you in front of an audience along with the content that's being discussed. It also is heard by the guests of It's Rainmaking Time who are also our listeners. And who are they? Best-selling authors, leaders of industry, frontrunners, creative artists, pioneers, visionaries. When you place a voice ad with us, we deliver a very engaging, dynamic, truthful, and authentic voice ad between two to three minutes to audiences of its rainmaking time. Call us at 626-398-8652 because during this segment with Corinne Drury of Swing Out Sister, you can place your voice ad right here. Call us at 626-398-8652 at the Rainmaking Company. And back to the show. When did you know you had a voice and that your life was going to go beyond fashion and modeling? Well, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're still on that discovery tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> but I, I help. Su- help, <laughs> Paul, come back. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I suppose the time when I made the decision to, to be a full-time singer was um, I, after I'd had a horse riding accident. It was Christmas 1984. Um, my stepfather had a horse. It, it hadn't really been ridden very much. It was, quite, it was quite young and I hadn't ridden for a long, long time. And I was going, oh, I'll have a go. Just thinking, it'll be fine. And I didn't have a proper riding hat. My mum said, I was going to ride bareback with no hat because I loved to do that when I was younger. And she said, well, you don't know the horse. I'm going, oh, it'll be fine. No, here, find a hat. And I found this hat that I'd had when I was a kid. It didn't have any safety standards. Um, it, it wasn't a safety standard approved hat. It was one that I had had when I was about probably a fashion hat, seven right? years old. Well, it was just it was Chapeau. before <laughs> before that kind of stuff existed. It was kind of bendy. It would it offered no protection. It had a piece of elastic sewn by hand under the chin, <laughs> and uh, I just thought, oh, well, I'll just wear this. And um, the horse went wild. Didn't want me on it. Uh, went galloping down the road, rearing and bucking. And I can remember the charge of the light brigade, I think, going through my head. Or is it William Tell's overture? <laughs> and I thought that was quite funny at the time because I kicked my feet out of the stirrups and threw down the reins. It was a young horse and I'd always had it drilled into me. You don't pull the reins on a young horse's mouth because if it damages the mouth, it could nobody could ride it it's going to be wild so I was doing a bit of horse whispering and just hugging it around the neck and holding onto the mane thinking stop 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 it wouldn't stop it wanted me off so I jumped and I hit a wall (laughs) (laughs) so the horse stopped as soon as I jumped off because my mum came by in in the pickup truck with my stepfather going oh who's that person covered in blood looking like some terrible victim of a terrible accident oh my god it's my daughter and the horse had stopped to eat grass luckily my mum just scooped me up and took me to hospital I was unconscious for three days her story is I sat a bolt upright as soon as I came round and said I'm going to be a pop star 
I'm going, no, I didn't say that. That wouldn't be my words. I wouldn't have said that for a start. And, <laughs> you know, I know I've changed. I, I, I did realize that I didn't want to go back to doing fashion design. And I had three months to lie and recuperate while I got my senses back. If I ever really got them back, I don't think I did. But I wrote down thoughts and feelings. That's all I could do. I couldn't really move. I was too dizzy to walk. I couldn't speak properly. I had to kind of get all my faculties back. And I was lucky to do that because you hear some horror stories that people have had head injuries, the terrible things that could happen. I was lucky. I think the only um, side effect I have had from that head injury is if I take down an eight-digit telephone number, I get the second to last two numbers the other way around. That's the only thing I've noticed. Wow. <laughs> and so that's quite lucky to get away with just that. But I think it also made me stop and think, I'm not really doing what I want to do in life. What am I going to do? When you've just about lost it and you've come back again, I think it does give you a feeling um, well, if I am here, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I better do what I want to do instead of piddling around thinking about it. Just follow your feelings. And I think that actually stopped me in my tracks and made me think, you know, I, w I want to be a singer. That's what I'm going to do. Prior to that, though, had you done any singing? Yes, I had done some demos actually with Andy and Martin and I ha I'd auditioned with a few bands. But I still had my regular job designing clothes. I was working for a big firm that supplied lots of high street stores. It was the more commercial end of fashion. I'd had my own business for a while. I wasn't really a very good business person. Lost quite a lot of money. And so <laughs> was in the process of paying back various loans. And so I thought, well, while I'm doing this, I'll have some fun and join a band and perhaps sing, you know, for a hobby. But I think the thing that a lot of people are fooled into thinking is a hobby is just something you do in your spare time and your job is what you do in the daytime. But actually, I turned it around and so my hobby became my job. And I wasn't really doing it in order to earn a living or for it to be a job. I was just doing something I loved and then I thought, well, actually, somebody's offering to give us a record contract and we can do this and then I don't have to do the job that I'm not enjoying anymore. This has become my job and it's it's quite a difficult transition to make to think if you really love doing something that much and then you can actually spend your life do it. doing it and, and earn a living from it, it's great. As long as you don't go into it thinking this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to make a million because then it won't happen. I think it's that whole looking the other way thing. Just look over there. Oh, wow, it's happened. I, I think, you know, that you've got to do something because you love doing it, and then the rest will take care of itself. But then maybe that's a bit of an idealistic way of thinking. <laughs> but I, I'm not very good at business. I'm not very good at dealing with money. I'm just careful if I get some. But, you know, I kind of would like to think I could do without if I really had to. It seems to me that one of the interesting things about you and Andy is that you don't really lose your poise. You have this centeredness about you in a field that it's very easy to lose your centeredness. You know, when you become popular and you become wanted and you become known, it's very easy to lose your way, and yet you haven't. How come you think you haven't? Um, well, I'm glad you think we haven't. <laughs> but um, I think really it's probably down to stubbornness. Um, we're both from the north of England. I, I don't know if that's <laughs> a particular trait of northerners, but um, I think probably you remain focused and you don't take compliments too well and you don't take criticism too well, or not too well. You don't take too much notice either way. You just focus on the thing that you do and the thing that you like doing, and it's great to be appreciated, but but you have to still maintain that balance and look straight ahead because it it can take you off course. You know, if you take too much notice, we ha we have people who pay us compliments, but we also have our critics, and you, so you don't really take too much notice of either. It's just you take it into account. But if you really let that go to your head you really wouldn't be able to continue in the direction you're going. That's probably what I think. <laughs> <laughs> if someone sat you down and said, look, you're not going to tour anymore. You're done. 
you can't tour anymore, would you be sad? Well, I'd think, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Now's the time for antagonism. <laughs> well, I think Let why? someone said you can't tour anymore, would you be sad? Uh, no, I'd probably say, well, who are you to tell me I can't tour There you anymore. go, there you go. <laughs> And, I mean, it, if you meant that there were a reason if I lost my voice or, you know, if there was something that was physically making it impossible for me to do it, I would be sad, but I'd find something else to do. You know, I'd find a way around it, but it's, um, that happens when it's the right time. You know, I don't think we've ever planned, oh, this is the year we're going to do a tour, this is the year we're not. It always just finds itself, and something comes along to stop it sometimes. Like, the last tour we were going to do for America, which is how Private View, our album, which is just <laughs> coming out in America, uh, came about because we rearranged some songs. We had a new acoustic setup, semi-acoustic setup with the band, quite a jazzy arrangements we'd done of our songs. And, you know, we thought that they haven't heard this in America before this way. This is going to sound great. And we had a great tour planned. And then the Icelandic volcano I came remember. along, oh my sprinkled God. its ash cloud over the whole of Europe. And we couldn't leave um nothing like this has ever happened before and this is where facebook comes in i hadn't taken much notice of facebook up until then and there were lots of people going oh we can't wait to see your gig in atlanta in boston and these various places and and i just thought it's not going to happen we have to tell people to go and get their tickets refunded because as the days went by another date was cancelled and we felt awful didn't know what to do and so all I could think of doing was to write to people on Facebook saying look it's looking unlikely we're trying our best and they go well can't you just get a flight from somewhere else? you don't understand the whole of Europe is grounded people can't move by train how long was car. that that was quite a long time it was about yeah. two weeks yeah. I think but even trying to get people were stranded all over Europe even the the rails you know the train tickets were all sold out people getting taxis from norway to london you know it's like it's like it was kind of ridiculous and people were getting stranded in all kinds of places couldn't afford to stay so having to get in touch with people to stay with and um so i wrote to people on facebook and said let's think of our top 10 songs um what would you think of if you were stuck in an ash cloud <laughs> <laughs> like something in the air and the air that yes. i breathe Uh, all I could think of doing was making a bit of a joke of it, but it was it was quite scary. We're thinking, how long is this going to go on? Are they being extra cautious? Are there going to be planes falling out of the sky because they've got volcanic ash in the engines? It was it was kind of the unknown. Um, but we also um, said to all the the venues. We want to cancel this gig, not postpone it, because then people could get a refund. Because we didn't know when we'd be able to do this tour again. We still haven't done it. We're too scared. It might call up another volcano <laughs> or some other natural disaster. <laughs> But um, the one good thing that did come out of it, as th that was the basis for our album Private View, because. I was saying to Andy, we've spent a few weeks rearranging these songs, especially for this tour. And whenever we've done something for one tour in particular, getting back to how we like to keep each other on our toes and the band and surprise ourselves, if we've done an arrangement and, and done it on one tour or one concert, the next time we, we can't help but change it because we want to keep ourselves fresh. Yeah, and it keeps everyone fresh. So we never really do the same thing again. It, it might be similar, but we'll have changed something. And I said, we've spent this time recording these songs. We really should go into the studio and record them, which we did, thank goodness. And so that's thanks to the Icelandic volcano, which I cannot pronounce without it sounding like I'm swearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so it did a great thing. We made a good thing happen out of a natural disaster. And that became the kind of basis for this album, Private View, which is some of our favorite songs we picked for a concert. And then we built on them in the studio and mixed them and rearranged them and added some more things. It was just kind of a, a little swirl of imagination that came out of a dust cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get scared when you come out on stage at first, a little bit of something? Only if I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, usually we've rehearsed so much, and that's thanks to Andy, who makes the whole band 
really rehearse so thoroughly till everyone's going, we really don't need to rehearse anymore. Yes, we do. And while we're rehearsing, new ideas evolve. And that's where the changes in arrangements and stuff comes along. But um, if we've just changed something in the sound check that day, or if, if something's gone wrong and it's thrown me slightly, that's really the only time I would get nervous. I mean, maybe for the first couple of lines of a song till I know everything's in the right place, the monitors are working, you can hear everybody. I might be a bit nervous, but then it's great to just settle in and go along with it. And and this is when this great thing happens, this exchange of energy and and you can feel stuff coming back from people as they're receiving stuff from you and I kind of get lost in the music from then on. So I, I probably wouldn't really remember much of what was happening throughout a gig unless somebody threw something or you fell down a <laughs> hole in the stage, both of which have happened. Really? You? Uh, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> well, that was a kind of, it was a bit of an impromptu gig. Somebody had said we were doing a performance once that we were unaware of in a club in Hong Kong and people had bought tickets and they were waiting outside. And I was going, we thought we were just going to do a question and answers interview. And uh, it was a bit of a makeshift everything. And there was a, oh, a piece of the stage was covered up with a piece of wood. And they said, don't step back on there. We're filming it from above. And we've got the logo of the band. And it was covering a staircase. It was kind of like a booby trap. So what oh did God. I do? I stepped back in it. And it was only like balsa wood. And the wood was stuck on my leg. And my leg was, it was about to carry on singing the song. It was like some ca comedy sketch, you know. <laughs> Sounds but, like it. But a few things that throw you. But it's kind of, it's good to overcome them and carry on and and see even if you forget a line you make a joke about it or perhaps nobody would even notice if you can do a jazzy thing with it and it gives you an idea for another arrangement it, it's kind of all about making the most of the situation going along with it working around with it you know and uh, it usually turns into something good <laughs> you travel so much don't you well, not so much now. No. I mean, I suppose it was quite a prophetic title for our first album, It's Better to Travel, because once the album came out, it went straight to number one in England. We weren't even in England when it was number one. We were in, in America. We were in L.A. Um, that's all we did for the first three or four years, constantly traveling. Our feet hardly touched the ground. <laughs> I think I went to yoga classes to see chiropractors, had every kind of healing I could have had in it <laughs> all over the world, you know, reflexology, massages, anything that could kind of uh, ground you because we were just flying around the world more or less constantly for three or four years. And I think we do a bit less now. And I quite like it. I think the pace has slowed down a bit. Things have changed, you know, that you can't really buy CDs anymore. You can't buy vinyl. Well, you can in specialist stores. That's coming back as a kind of revival, isn't it? Um, but it's kind of strange. But you do really have to adapt to survive the whole online streaming, downloading, thing I didn't really like at first I didn't really like Facebook but like I said before the volcano in Iceland was the thing that made me get on Facebook and actually talk to people because I thought we've got a lot of disappointed people here if if we don't communicate and and it is really nice that you can direct your thoughts and people can direct their thoughts to you and it's immediate you know I mean you, you can't reply to everybody um, you can't always be there but every now and then you know, there is this vortex of people. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. No matter what the state of the economy is, there will always be time-honored traditions and special events. The Sterling Hut has been in business since 2008, offering a wide range of fantastic sterling silver products, including finely crafted mint julep cups, personalized baby shower gifts, photo albums, exquisite jewelry boxes and awards, and so much more. The Sterling Hut is an authorized Silver Star international reseller of fine silver products and anniversary gifts. The business is owned by Jewel and Bob Howard. If you would be interested in buying someone a gift of pure sterling silver or sterling plated silver, you can call 1-888-819-1009.
get a 15% discount by going to the Sterling Hut. The Sterling, S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G, Hut, H-U-T, dot com, and saying it's rainmaking time. They will honor a 15% discount for you. Beautiful sterling silver gifts for all of life's occasions. Manufactured in Italy and handcrafted by skilled artisans. They can also be engraved in sterling picture frames, oval and rectangular silver trays, champagne ice buckets, silver goblets, coffee and tea service, coffee pots, silver mugs, candelabras, and silver jewelry unrivaled in design and style. Go to the Sterling Hut at sterlinghut.com. And back to the show. Bobby Lamb from Chicago, a keyboard player and singer in Chicago, was interviewed recently. And uh, he used to be a client of mine years ago. Uh-huh. And in the early days when I did massage, when I left my tennis profession, I was teaching tennis and doing massage. And so musicians and producers were my clients. And this wonderful interview he did in the last six months, the person was talking to him about how the online world has affected business for artistic people and musicians and how tough the business is now where people are buying one song at a time they're not necessarily buying cds like they used to now with the whole online thing and he said there's no way we could have done what we did then today we would have never made it Mm. the same do you think that like there's some kind of something about that probably but i think it's kind of you win some you lose some you lose some you win some i don't know that patterns of everything are constantly changing and I suppose 20, 30 years ago, there was a lot of money being thrown around in the music industry. When we first started, I can remember thinking, this is just ridiculous. It's not going to last. There's so many, so much money being plowed into it. And if you think prior to that, pre-Beatles maybe, you know, you made uh, quite a, a reasonable living from being a performer, a singer, an entertainer, but it wasn't ridiculous. It takes different professions, take it in turns to kind of blow out of all proportion, whether it's footballers, bankers, um, technology, um, innovators, you know, different people have their time, don't they? And I think with music, it's a changing time. It's a lot to do with the technology, but I think you can make yourself um, apparent to people a lot better. Maybe you needed to have that introduction in a time when it was a bit more focused. But although it's not so focused now, I think the people who are out there listening to music are a lot more discerning. You know, they can pick and choose the things they really want to. But it, it is confusing. I think if I was 14, 15 years old, where would I start? We used to have a top 30 chart every Sunday night played on the radio, so you knew which new songs were being released. And then there was Top of the Pops, a TV program. We only had three channels in those days. You know, so everything was a lot more focused, but um, was it controlled by fewer people? I don't know. So now everything's very fragmented. There's a lot more choice. So if you're really going to delve into it, you can find much more interesting things. But but do people have the time or the resources to look so thoroughly? I don't know. Who's making the choices now? Because you've got Google search engines. That's only going to come up with the people who've already had some hits or who've maybe... uh, Buying advertising. Yeah, I I don't know. Things work in different ways, so... I think perhaps this whole digital revolution is making live performances come to the fore again because people can be accessible but so distant, but smaller, closer concerts are probably more in vogue because who wants to go and see a great big stadium gig when you're watching somebody on a screen? You do that for a certain time in your life, but I sure. think there's a point when you actually want to know something's real and close up, and you're actually going to feel it and be touched by it. So I, I think it's, it's 
swings and roundabouts, things change, come in and out of vogue. And as, along with the benefits, um, you know, there, there are pros, there are cons. Publishing has also become, not just music publishing, but as you know, content publishing has taken a very similar turn. I mean, the good part about the content publishing side is that if you have something that you can write and it touches people or it connects to people and you can package it, you can get your book out today, just very much like you can go get a song out today. And you don't have to go through those levels and layers, very much like the music industry of all these huge blocks to getting published. The flip side of that is there's so many people who have something to say. The melting pot is way larger and audiences and customers may take longer to find you or to hear about you, etc. But at least you can get your work out. Yeah. So that's the upside of it. Yeah, it is just how do you get through? I don't know, but then some funny little thing will just capture everyone's imagination and maybe pull you through. You know, it's a, I don't really know how that happens. I know there are big engines at work controlling things, but there are also other things that are very random and very Ethereal. personal. Uh, yeah, it can work in both ways. I, I suppose focus is the thing with all of this digital revolution and the internet and every kind of social networking site, there's always something new coming up, a different form of communication. And then as one gets saturated or hijacked, then something else will come along. And that that's great in a way, but keeping up with it can be tricky. You know, there, there are so many different forms of communication these days. Which one do you choose? I mean, I, I turn everything off. I was going to ask you about that. How plugged in are you to the electronics and um, social networks? And I, I take it and leave it. Sometimes I'll be absorbed by it, and I think it's great to have those tools at your fingertips and then other times I get totally overwhelmed and confused by it and I just want to turn everything off. So I'll go for a, a few hours or maybe a, a week or two. Maybe my phone, I'll have it turned down, I'll only take the odd text. Because I just think back to the times when you only had a landline in your house. That was the only form of communication you had. or maybe telepathy <laughs> and I think telepathy actually is coming into it a lot more the times now I'll be thinking of someone they've just sent me a Facebook message or they're sending me a text or I don't know that used to happen with telephones but but now there's a lot more uh, levels to tune into to see who's communicating with you where but I really think if you think hard enough about someone you will get in touch and maybe that's going to be after this whole digital revolution, every form of communication, we're going to go back to the very basic Aboriginal American Indian animal instinctive ants. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got the ideas for computers from ants, actually. If you see the way they communicate, we, we actually are, are just trying to emulate them, but we don't. We don't do it with our natural resources. We've had to get this huge industry, global industry, working to make those things work. But um, I think at the end of the day, it's all going to boil down to telepathy. Speaking of telepathy, you were sharing with me about an hour and a half ago about how you talk to animals. <laughs> and I would like you to, I'd like you, since I'm out of the closet, I talk to animals all the time. And a lot of people roll their eyes when I walk by on the streets because I'm talking to the canines. Hello, Danny. Hello, Bodie. Hello, this one. I'd like you to share a little bit about your relationship with animals because I feel finally I'm not alone in this. And you won't lose your great reputation. <laughs> I, <laughs> Andy may be cringing over at the studio. But yeah, I'm speaking on behalf of myself here. This has nothing to do with Andy. But it's partly to do with the fact that um, my mum, I'm, I'm actually named after a dog, <laughs> a poodle I hasten to add, <laughs> and my mum used to have a dog clipping parlour in the 60s. So I grew up with a whole family of dogs. I mean, they were my brothers and sisters. And my mum used to have to put me on a lead and chain me up with the dogs. This would give social services a field day this, <laughs> these days, but it was all done so I wouldn't crawl around in the dog hair clippings all over the floor. So I'd be t tied up with, <laughs> with the rest of the dogs. I could crawl around, but just <laughs> in the space. And they'd be licking and barking. And so, you know, they were like 
family to me, really. And I think ever since then, I, I'm never afraid of dogs. I always think they're my friends. And I forget myself when I'm walking through the park or down the street. And I always talk to them, sometimes with a little bark or a, <laughs> you know, sympathetic sound as well. And sometimes the owners are really pleased. I mean, sometimes I get to know the dogs, you know, like you were saying, more than the owners. <laughs> and they'll come up and jump up and the owners are like, oh, God, I'm really sorry. I'm go No, I don't care. We, we already know each other. <laughs> but, yeah, I do talk to dogs and I talk to cats as well. Yeah. <laughs> I have to change frequency and talk in a smaller voice to cats because I kind of think you don't want to scare them off. And then they start following you down the street and I think, oh no, the owners will think I'm trying to steal them and so then I have to shoo them away and make them go back. How long have you been talking to animals? Since you were All of two or three? <laughs> See, nobody knows this about you. I feel so much better now than when I walk around the neighborhood. <laughs> you yeah. know. Well, I talk to them and impersonate the tone of whatever their bark or meow is. But I do that with people as well. And then I forget myself. I mean, I'll probably be able to get you down <laughs> by the end of this interview. But I didn't realize until a while ago that I actually I listen to people and I listen to the inflections in their voice and every little tone and nuance and I mimic them and that's probably because I'm a singer you know it's kind of a I'm not doing it for any other reason that I'm trying to get inside why they s pronounce and speak the way they do that goes for languages and people I'm okay at languages but I'm probably better at just listening to the tone and where people's voice comes from you know across the world some people talk through their nose the front of the mouth the back of their throat different nations have a different Inflation. sounds yeah and i'm quite interested in stuff like that and so it probably all just comes down to communication do you speak other languages i speak a bit of french a bit of italian i had some japanese lessons but i wouldn't say i could speak japanese you spend a lot of time in japan don't yeah, you? yeah and i'm ashamed that how little japanese i can speak when you when you realize how how long we've actually spent there but um it's quite a mathematical language, and I'm not very good at mathematics. <laughs> say mushy mushy. Yeah. You know that one? Yeah, mushy mushy, I can just about say. But I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, Testing you. <laughs> I like to hear other people speaking their languages <laughs> and sometimes imagine what they're saying. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Andy. Whatever it is that you would be comfortable to talk about. It seems to me that you and Andy have something that the Indian people would call dharma. You have dharma together. You have relationship and calling that you share together, which many people who are together usually have the relationship part, but they don't have dharma. They don't have calling together that they share. Alan Marilyn Bergman and other couples and people that share life together have that. It's a very unusual, rarefied terrain mm. that you're living in, however it is that your life is worked out on the day to day. And I wondered if you would share a little bit about what you'd like to share about that, because that's very unusual. Yeah, well, I think with Andy and myself, we spend a lot of time together, but we respect each other's space. And I think um, you can't know everything about somebody and you shouldn't want to know everything about somebody. And no other person is your possession. And I think perhaps sometimes, you know, we started off working together and then we became partners in life. And so something can change then if you're not careful. Um, we never got married. We're free to walk if we want to walk. And I think we allow each other our space, creative space and and freedom, really. You know, we don't... We're not possessive about each other, and I think that it's quite important to be able to trust someone and to not be looking for reasons to not trust someone unless it's something obviously affecting your life. You know, we, we spend a lot of time together and we spend time away from each other when we need to. And I think that works, really. I think it's, it's back down to that element of surprise. You've You've got to have a few surprises for each other. You know, and we're quite different people in a lot of ways. 
So I think we don't try to emulate each other or to be alike. We we have our own respective places and we have an area where we cross over and come together. Do you ever travel away from each other where, let's say you go visit somebody for a few days somewhere or you leave for two weeks or whatever and find out in the middle of it that you really miss him or he really misses you or is your time when you're together you're so together that your separateness is really totally whole and okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. I mean, I suppose in this day and age of communications, we're never really that far away from each other. But sometimes, yeah, we, we spend time apart and then it just makes you appreciate each other more, I think. Gives you a bit of peace and quiet as well, but... <laughs> I don't know. It, it's good to My mother used to say that. <laughs> oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to think about uh, the space you inhabit and what you do within that space. And you sometimes don't notice it when there's two of you in the space. So when it's completely a space of your your own, then you you realize the bits that are being used or not used and and how I'm talking myself into a funny space here. Uh, if you inhabit a space with two people and you work around each other, and then you see how you feel in a space when you're totally by yourself, you you perhaps see the bits that you have you compensate for or you that are missing. Adjust you. Yeah, and and so it's good to have a time of readjustment and you think, well, actually, I'm not doing enough of this because that's what Andy does, or, you know, we, we kind of work around each other. But, but, yeah, that doesn't really make sense, the thing I just said. <laughs> I know I only gave you water and a little coffee. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. It's funny how sometimes you don't take action until people have died. I remember visiting my mother in an Alzheimer's facility in Studio City, and my cousins, Carol and Dan, were there. And I had this little tape recorder with me my dad had passed on five years before. And I started to interview my cousins, Carol and Dan, about my parents because they were very close to them, and they knew them for many years even before they were married. I want you to know that I got the funniest, most adorable stories about my mom and dad that I would have never heard otherwise. I kid you not. I found out that my dad, Buddy Greenhouse, used to invite people to massive parties, bring everybody together, and then they'd all get to the party and they'd go, where's Buddy? And he was not there. In other words, he would just put the whole thing together, get everybody to come, and sometimes he would not show up. Now, you may not think that's funny. You may think that's rude and all that, but I thought that was hysterical <laughs> when I first heard about it. It's just not something that I would think that my dad was capable of, but apparently he was. Many of you listening to the show are going to wait until your parents and your sisters and brothers and cousins pass on before you ever capture the wonderful stories and legacy of your family. I'm making a very special service available to those of you that would like me to interview your family and capture the wonderful stories that are the gift of your family legacy. It's a really special service. It's very confidential and private and can be done in either audio or video. Don't miss the occasion to capture the living legacy of your family and the great treasures that are sitting there. I'm a miner. I know how to get to those treasures. Call me at its rainmaking time at 626-398-8652. Thank you. And back to the show. Who in the music field would you love to meet? Is there some people that you would love to meet or people you've already met that you were really inspired by or people now that you would really like to meet that you get excited about and you would really like to meet them? I think it's always difficult meeting people that you're kind of uh, inspired by or impressed by because you don't want to destroy that illusion because sometimes people can create great things but it's not somebody you particularly want to meet or befriend. But one person we did meet, and that was not disappointing, and he was fantastic, was Bert Bacharach. And he is an area where Andy and I come together because he writes great music and he's worked with some great people, one of whom is my favourite singer, 
And one of my favourite singers, Dion Warwick. Yeah. I mean, he's lot, he's worked with some of the great people as well. But um, to meet him, we performed actually at the Albert Hall. We supported him at the Albert Hall, and so we got to hear his sound check and everything. It was great. It was just amazing. And I just think I don't probably go looking for people to meet, but sometimes on our travels, there's somebody. It's like wow. This person is someone who's really inspired and influenced me, and now we've met them, and it's just been a casual meeting, and it's great. Almost as if it's been prearranged upstairs, yeah. right? Yeah. Plopped in your. And it was wonderful. Lap. Well, that came about. It was a complete accident. Our agent said, "Well, this gig's come up at the Albert Hall, and uh, they're they're looking for someone to support Bert Bacharach. Do you fancy doing it?" I didn't really think you'd be interested, and we were like, "You what?" We were in Japan at the time, and we. We came straight back from Japan to the Albert Hall with Burt Bacharach. What a wonderful, wonderful surprise that was. And last year we played at the Java Jazz Festival in Jakarta and supported Stevie Wonder. We were on stage wow. in between Bobby McFerrin and Stevie Wonder. It's like, how great was that? And so many inspirational people were there, people who have inspired us. Um, Herbie Hancock being one of them, and we quite often bump into him. He's such a great guy, and he was Andy's one of Andy's favourite keyboard players. And I didn't really know that much about him until Andy introduced me to him. And it's like we keep bumping into him, and it's like people who have <laughs> given you inspiration and something. It's so nice to casually meet them backstage at a gig or a TV show or a festival, and you're able to say thank you, you know. And, to see Stevie Wonder doing his sound check. I mean, it, one of the first albums I ever bought was Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. And it's like, he's still here and he's still inspiring me and he's still doing something great. And we're playing on the same stage as him at a jazz festival. How great is that? It's just, uh, I don't think I go looking for people, but they just... Appear. Yeah. Dion Warwick was also doing a jazz festival we did in Thailand and... Um, we went to see her gig and somebody said, oh, we know she's your favorite singer. Why don't you come backstage and meet her? And I didn't want to. I just thought, oh, she'll be tired and she's probably got too much to do. And uh, I heard that they were leaving the next morning. So I thought, I'll go and say bye and that I enjoyed her gig. And she said, why didn't you come to the gig last night? And I said, I was at the gig, but I thought you were going to come back and say hi. And I go, I didn't really want to bother you. <laughs> so she kind of was expecting, you know. I, I didn't want to seem like, oh, I'm a mad fan, I'm going to come and rah, want your <laughs> autograph. But I kind of thought, oh, she's just on a gig and there'll be people to see and things to do. I didn't want to trouble her. But she was so lovely. It was great to see her just in a very casual situation. She was just leaving for the airport. What a lovely lady. And I bumped into her a couple of times. I bumped into her at an airport once before. And I said, Andy, that's Dion Warwick. He said, oh, you're not really going to go and say anything. I was going, I just have to go and tell her how much I like her. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she was just getting a passport checked at the airport. And I just think it's nice when things are just very spontaneous and you'll bump into somebody who's inspired you. I always like to say thank you. <laughs> say your name fully again. Corinne. Corinne Drury. Corinne Drury. Yes. You mean like Corinne Drury? <laughs> yes. You've inspired me for years, years and years, your music and who you are and what you put out in the world and it's such a great pleasure to be with you today. Talk a little bit about Vision On. I see that you post some work about Vision On and these gatherings. Talk about that. Well Vision On just came about. A friend and I were doing a club playing some music. We happened to call it Vision On which was a kids TV program in the 60s which people of our age and a bit younger would probably remember. You could send in your pictures and they'd have a gallery at the end. And there are all kinds of interesting little creative sketches with mime and plasticine animation and all kinds of stuff. It was all about art and music and movement. And so um, I said, if we're calling it Vision On, we should just leave some papers and pencils and plasticine so people can create stuff if they want to. Not really expecting that people would really take that on. But suddenly, people turned up, they're listening to some music, have a drink, 
it's a night out with their friends and they were drawing pictures, making plasticine models and that's developed and now I think people come expecting to make something. It's got a bit more three-dimensional now and there's myself, Johnny Trunk who he makes, uh, he, he's a DJ and he has a record label and another friend Claire Douglas is an artist and she usually gets the creative flow going and introduces some element whether it's headgear or masks or something with some wall hanging and everybody starts making stuff and it's great I mean everyone goes home with a smile on their face and wearing some strange thing they've made out of paper or cardboard or it's just a, a meeting of creative minds really I think people just it's, it's nothing, nothing is decided, it's just open. There isn't really a plan, there's just some music and some art materials. Did you start this one here um, in London? Yeah, with, with my friend Johnny, who's the DJ, and Claire, who's an artist, so it, was, it just kind of evolved, you know. We did do a, a club with just music and that really wasn't that successful, but since people have come along and been able to make things. I think they really like that combination of music and and just letting your imagination run wild. Is there an age range to this? No, that's what somebody said the other day. It's great, there's younger people, there's older people. It's just a mixture, a, an eclectic mix of people and ideas. Sounds wonderful. What does your mom and dad think of the work that you're doing? I don't know, I think they're quite proud. I grew up with my mum from the age of 11 because my mum and dad got divorced so I think she just kind of struggled to bring me and three boys up and um, so we kind of shared the duties of bringing the boys up so when I left home I kind of thought <laughs> now I've got some freedom and it was great to sort of have that creative freedom I was at art school and I think my mum she gave me some strange advice when I left <laughs> left home. She couldn't really afford to provide much in the way of education or a, or um, any kind of start up to any career. She said, I, I don't really know how I can help you. All I can say is whatever you do, do the best you possibly can, even if you're a prostitute. <laughs> and I'm going, thanks, Mum. That wasn't the career <laughs> I was thinking of going into. <laughs> She said, whatever you do, make sure you're a damn good. <laughs> and I don't know why she said that. I think it was she could have expected anything to happen. But, um, you know, I wasn't particularly promiscuous as a teenager. I don't know why that came to mind. <laughs> and I suppose if you look at it that way, anything that you're going to do in the world and get paid for, maybe it is a form of prostitution. Who knows? But uh, I just thought, I always laugh about that and think it's quite funny advice for a mum to give to a 16-year-old daughter. <laughs> Has she seen you on stage? Has oh, she yeah, gone to your concerts? Or? Yeah, I think she loves coming to our concerts and, and I think she's very proud. Even though her favourite singers were people like Mahalia Jackson, Bessie Smith, um, the kind of blues singers of the 20s and 30s. and she used to sing in a jazz band and, and sing their songs. And I, so I think she thinks I'm a bit lightweight. <laughs> but you're doing the best. Yeah, yeah, I think she likes what we do, but I think it's, it's probably not the kind of music she would, she would have made. But um, yeah, I think she's quite proud. Do you get a chance to see your dad much? Yeah, I see him too, and he's been to see us play. Actually, my dad played bass and probably, um, you know, that. They were both musical. My parents, my dad used to play in a band and my mum sang in a jazz band, so I've probably got something from both the family. of them. Yeah. What's um, next for you and Andy? Good question. We've got a project in the pipeline, some new songs. We've done some recordings with a big band. We've done a couple of performances with a big band, so we'd like to take that somewhere else with our next songs. Um, but not in any way in a sort of swing, big band, traditional style. I think uh, we'd just like to take that sound and take it somewhere else. But we don't know where yet. <laughs> <laughs> when you pass away and you come back for your next time around and you get your ticket <laughs> to <laughs> Earth and you get a chance to choose again, what would you choose? I don't think I would change anything. I think everything I've done has been a bit of an accident. My life has been a succession of uh, 
happy accidents. Synchronicity. Yeah. Or serendipity. Serendipity. Yeah. But I don't think I would necessarily change anything. I've probably had some some good times and some sad times, but I, I think with all of the things, if you take them and weigh them up, it just depends on how you react to anything. I think I probably have done what I was supposed to do, and so I don't know if it's possible to choose. You just see where life yeah, Would you come back you. and sing all over again? Yeah, probably. Would you tour more? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Let's say you had a little Jetson ship and you didn't have to get on a plane, trains and all, you could just zip on over. Yeah. You'd probably tour a little more, right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be good to do it a bit more, but if you do it too much, then you're not putting anything new into it. I think that's the thing. If we go away and come back again, we add new elements and keep it fresh. So, But yeah, we probably could do it a little bit more than we have done. <laughs> Do you have favorite songs of your own um, that you and Andy have composed? Well, they change, I think. And do you still love doing the ones that everybody knows you for and remembers you for? I do, because I think they're the songs that have opened the door. They're the key to all the other songs. And like I was saying before, we are constantly changing the way we perform the songs that we have. So they're, they're evolving. They, they're they different every time, so I think if we did try and replicate them exactly the way they were when we first did them, we would be a bit fed up with doing the same old songs, but they've evolved along with us, I think. The other members of your band are also really interesting people, wonderful people. I've never seen so much smiling in my life in your <laughs> sessions, in your production sessions. You also look like you have a really great time. Yeah, I think we, we're we surrounded by a group of people that we really get on with. And, you know, when we're in that room together, in the rehearsal room, on stage, in the studio, I think we're all up for experimenting and for just exchanging ideas and energies. And it it makes you feel good. You know, it's a, it's a great thing to go and have a, a musical workout. It's very blessed. You live a very blessed life. You know that? I think we're lucky to lead the life that we do, and we really appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. I mean, but we're lucky to, to work with some great people, and um, it makes touring a pleasure. It's an honor and a pleasure to sit with you, and I'm so glad that you made time for me and for its rainmaking time in London. Yeah, it's great to meet you on this rainy day in London. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to Corinne. Drury, Corin, Corin yes. Drury, <laughs> the lead singer of the band Swing Out Sister. We've missed Andy today, but he has been here in spirit, and we got to capture and learn about him as well. I thank you so much, and it's rainmaking time. Thanks thank again. You. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have just heard this interview with Corin Drury on its rainmaking time, thank you for listening. For those of you that would like to find out more about Swing Out Sister and their music and concerts, please go to swingoutsister.com. They can also be reached on Facebook and Twitter. Sign up for their Facebook and Twitter page to get updates on what's happening with them. They have a wonderful new special deluxe CD and DVD set, which was just released. It's called Private View plus Tokyo Stories DVD, and you can get that at amazon.com. They're on SoundCloud. They're also on YouTube. It's a very different time for artists. Buy their new Private View Special Deluxe CD and DVD. I'm sure once you're acquainted with their music, you'll see why you should have your own package. And for those of you that enjoyed the interview, please let us know. Leave your comment on itsrainmakingtime.com after the segment. And for those of you that are picking this up on iTunes, We'd really appreciate your review on iTunes. This increases the distribution and expands the show. We also want to say one other thing to all of you. Let's go. Let's get this interview all over the world. Let's get everybody listening to Swing Out Sister who loves music. You can't help but be engaged once you start listening to them. Pass it on. Share this show on Facebook, on Twitter, on all the social networks, through emails, I'll bet a few hundred thousand of you, if you sent it to 10 people, we could get the next million people listening to Swing Out Sister. Thank you for your support. 
Thank you for listening. And thank you, Corinne Drury, for making yourself available. Let's go. It's rainmaking time.